Hi, this is chapter 8 and it's on energy and enzymes and it's also an introduction to metabolism. In this chapter we're going to talk about what happens to energy and chemical reactions and can chemical energy drive non-spontaneous reactions. We'll also talk about the role of enzymes and what they do to speed up reactions and those factors that affect enzymes. At the very end of the chapter, we'll talk about enz how enzymes work to together to create metabolic pathways. There's two types of energy. There's kinetic energy and potential energy. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion, and it's thermal energy. It's the energy of molecules moving. And I always think about sumo wrestlers, like sweaty sumo wrestlers fighting in that little tiny ring. They're moving and they're generating a lot of heat. So that would be kinetic energy, like kinesiology. The second form of energy is potential energy. Potential energy is stored energy, and I always think of potential position. They both begin with PO, potential position. And this is chemical energy. So where is energy stored in a molecule? Energy is stored in the chemical bonds. So when we start talking about bonds in just a little bit, they're so important because that is exactly where energy is stored. Energy can be transformed when, from one type to another. So in this diagram, here's an example of how energy can be transformed. Here you see a red ball on top of a waterfall, and notice it starts to fall. So at the very beginning, it's located up high. So we're talking about position, potential energy. In frame two, as the ball falls down with the waterfall, it is in motion, and that motion is kinetic energy. And then lastly, in frame three, you see that it hits the very bottom of the waterfall and it makes a loud noise. And also that slamming of the water is mechanical energy. So energy is released in the form of mechanical energy, heat, and sound. So the initial high energy of the ball has actually been transformed. Chemical reactions involve energy transformations. So when we look at energy or chemical energy, it is all based on the type of bonds. And remember, when we talk about covalent bonds, we're talking about the sharing of electrons. Okay, so if, if, if electrons are shared equally, they will have greater energy. If they're not shared equally between two atoms, then they will have less energy. So it says here that the potential energy of molecules depends on the configuration and position of its shared electrons. So weaker bonds with equally shared electrons have high potential energies. Stronger bonds, but with unequally shared electrons, have low potential energy. So if two electrons are shared equally, high potential energy. If they're not, like for example, remember oxygen and nitrogen are electronegative, so they tend to pull electrons towards their nucleus. Those, those reactions or those atoms will have lower potential energy. In this figure 8.2, you can see that the strongest, strongest or greatest amount of potential energy is found between carbon and hydrogen. And the reason is, is because it's a non-polar covalent bond. In other words, electrons are shared equally. Notice that both nitrogen and oxygen are electronegative. And notice the electrons are shifting towards nitrogen or oxygen and as they do that they lose the potential energy in the bond. Chemical reactions involve energy transformations. So just to repeat again, potential energy is in the bonds. 
if electrons are shared equally they have high potential energy and if they're shared unequally they have less so it says change in energy is transformed to thermal or light energy so if those bonds are broken then that energy can be transformed the first law of thermodynamics says that energy is conserved it cannot be created nor destroyed energy can only be transferred or transformed and this is really important this is the first law of thermodynamics and you must know this you must know this for future tests another word that is new is enthalpy and new it is when we talk about energy we talk about electrons and now enthalpy and all of these words begin with the letter E and they're all associated with energy enthalpy which is indicated by H is the total energy found in a molecule in other words it is the total heat content found in a, in, in a molecule and this heat content affects affects surrounding pressure and volume around it so it says here that when we talk about changes in the total energy of a molecule we're talking about delta H every time you see a triangle or a delta it means a change it's a subtraction to what we initially had and to what has happened so that change or difference in potential energy here you see a beetle and there's been a change in potential energy and as this beetle is releasing steam from its posterior end and it's doing this to protect itself notice that the thumbnail is is sort of pinching down on the it, the beetles antennae so there's a reaction and this reaction is releasing energy and you can see the energy is released as steam so that brings us to two types of chemical transformations. We can have exothermic reactions or endothermic reactions. So let's look at exothermic. Exo means to exit and thermic is heat. It's an expression of energy. So an exothermic reaction releases heat. And when it releases heat, then delta H or enthalpy decreases it becomes less than zero or negative so this indicates a loss of potential energy on the other hand endothermic endo means in and thermic again means heat so heat energy is taken up and to express this delta H or the change in total energy of a molecule becomes greater it becomes greater than zero it's positive and this shows that the products have a higher potential energy than the reactants. You must know this for your upcoming test. Now, you know what I think about? When I think about an exothermic reaction, I think about cellular, respir cellular respiration, the breakdown of sugar to CO2. When all those bonds are broken, those bonds that are storing potential energy, there's a release of energy. Delta H becomes less than zero and energy is released. So what's an example of an endothermic reaction? That would be building sugar from CO2, taking CO2 or someone's bad breath and building it up to C6, H1206. That requires a lot of energy. So energy is coming in to actually build bonds in a larger molecule. So the product has higher potential energy than the reactant. You guys should remember entropy. Entropy is indicated by the letter S. And entropy means disorder. That brings us to the second law of thermodynamics, which states that total entropy always increases in a system. So disorder is always increasing in a system. How do we express that? Delta S is greater than zero. So changes in entropy always increase. Disorder is always increasing. The next thing that you need to know if we put all of these, uh, these terms together to describe energy 
It brings us to this equation, Gibbs free energy equation. Delta G is equal to delta H minus T times delta S. You must know this for your next exam. So what is free energy all about? Before you do a reaction in a lab environment, sometimes you want to know, is it going to be an endothermic or exothermic reaction? Well, you can calculate it using Gibbs free energy. So if we take a closer look at the equation, what does delta H minus T times delta S mean? It means that Gibbs free energy or a change in it is dependent on total energy minus disorder. Now the T represents temperature in degrees Kelvin. So as you can imagine, as temperature increases, as you multiply it times changes in, in disorder, that's going to increase disorder. So you have total energy represented by delta H minus changes in disorder. If disorder is greater than total energy, then delta G will be negative. But on the other hand, if total energy is greater than disorder, then delta G will be positive. Please pay close attention to changes in delta G. You'll have to know this for your next exam. When delta G is less than zero, then you know that you have a spontaneous reaction. That means that delta G is a negative number and that means it's an exergonic reaction or another way of saying it even though your book says there's a difference I sort of think when I see exergonic I'm thinking of an exothermic reaction a release of energy when delta G is greater than zero then we have an intergonic or endothermic reaction in other words delta G is a positive number in other words it requires energy. So exergonic reactions typically occur when you break down a big molecule into smaller molecules. When do we have endergonic or endothermic reaction? When is it that we need energy inputs? It's when we're going from small molecules to big molecules. When delta G is equal to zero, that means the reaction is at equilibrium. So what can affect delta G? Well, there's two basic things that can affect delta G or gives free energy. And those two things are concentration and temperature. So both temperature and concentration can affect reaction rates. See, does this make sense? And intuitively, it does. So if you start increasing the temperature, it's like water boiling water all of those water molecules start to hit each other and that's why the water looks like it's boiling. So the more collisions you have, the more opportunities you have for a reaction to occur. So as temperature increases, you're actually increasing the potential for a reaction to occur. How about concentration? The more concentration you have of a chemical and increases the number of collisions you're going to have too between or among molecules. And so the greater the concentration or the greater the temperature is going to increase reaction rates. And the opposite is also true. The, the lower the temperature it starts slowing down the molecules. Also there's no, if you don't have very much of a chemical, how can you expect it to collide and therefore have a reaction? I love this example that's in your book because it's done by graduate students. And here in these two experiments, they prove to you that increases in temperature and increases in concentration will increase reaction rates. So increases in temperature and increases in concentration will increase reaction rates. The next thing that your book talks about is energetic coupling. Well, coupling means like a couple, two people together, but in this case, what is being coupled? 
endergonic and exergonic reactions, or I'm using them to mean the same endothermic or exothermic reactions. And that sort of makes sense, doesn't it? One reaction releases heat, but the other one requires energy, so it makes sense that, that they would be coupled together. So one reaction can drive a second reaction. I love this diagram that's in your book, figure 8.5, because at the top part, you see that there's an exergonic reaction. You have a high energy reactant, or a very large molecule, and then it, it produces a low energy product. Well, I bet you that those are very, very small molecules with very few bonds. So it releases energy because bonds are broken. Well, where's that energy going to go? It's going to be coupled with a second reaction. And in the second reaction, which is endergonic, energy is going to be used to build high energy products. So we start from low energy and we build high energy products. So the energy has to come from somewhere and it's coming from an exergonic reaction. The other thing that's important to talk about when we're talking about energy is oxidation and reduction. Or another way of saying that is redox reactions. So it's important to remember that oxidation is the loss of electrons. Reduction is the gain of electrons. So oxidation. I often think of like Star Trek and when they're on another planet and they're fighting each other, they have those oxidizing guns. And when they shoot at it at their opponent, their faces and their bodies start to disintegrate and disappear. In other words, they're losing all of their electrons. Reduction means a reduction in the charge of an ion. So when you accept more electrons, you reduce the charge. And so that's where reduction comes in even though it seems counterintuitive. So reduction is a gain in electrons. And it says that these two reactions always occur together. So let's think about it. Energy cannot be created nor destroyed. So if an electron moves, it has to go somewhere. So that's why oxidation and reduction is always coupled together because energy cannot be created nor destroyed. So that movement of electrons is a form of energy. Oxidation is exergonic and reduction is endergonic. Redox reactions transfer energy via electrons. Now I'm going to be honest with you guys. I don't know why, but it almost took me like a decade to understand oxidation and reduction. I would ask my husband to explain it to me over and over and over and thankfully he never got really angry with me and I think what I did in my mind is I made it just more difficult than what it really is. Energy and electrons again both begin with the letter E. So when we talk about the movement of electrons, what are we talking about? We're talking about the movement of energy and energy cannot be created nor destroyed. So if energy or electrons is released from, from one atom or molecule, it has to be accepted somewhere else. So we have oxidation and reduction. Now, another thing that's sort of strange is you can have an oxidation reduction reaction, not just by losing or gaining electrons, by, but by also shifting the position of how electrons are shared between two atoms. So in this example we have glucose in the presence of oxygen is broken down to CO2 and water. This is an, is an exer, exothermic or exergonic reaction and notice that there's a release of energy. We're going from a high energy reactant to a low energy product. So energy is released. And so here you can see the movement or the sharing of electrons between atoms.
and notice that there's a shift. There's a shift between equally shared to polar covalent bonds. So this is indicative of oxidation and reduction. Another way of understanding oxidation and reduction or redox reactions is to look at atoms or molecules as electron donors and electron acceptors. Now, how can we tell that electrons have moved? So one way of knowing that electrons have moved is also by tracking protons. And you say what? Protons? Well, when I talk about protons in this case, I'm talking about the ionized form of hydrogen, or H+. So when electrons move, so does hydrogen. And we can usually track this movement of electrons by tracking the movement of protons or the movement of hydrogen. So it says here reduction often adds hydrogens, oxidation removes hydrogens. When we start talking about photosynthesis and cellular respiration, we're going to talk about molecular shuttles. And these molecular shuttles are shuttling electrons going from oxidation and reduction reactions. How can we tell that these electron shuttles are actually reduced? When I say that they're reduced, that means that they're accepting electrons. It's like a taxi. A taxi has passengers in, it's full, it's reduced. And then when the passengers get out of the taxi, then, then the taxi is oxidized. It is lost its passengers. Well, the same thing can be said for FAD and NAD. Both of these are electron carriers. They're like little electron taxis at the cellular levels. When it's empty or oxidized, it's just FAD or NAD. But when they're reduced, in other words, when they're carrying electrons, we know this because we write we write the molecule as FADH2. In other words, we're tracking the movement of electrons by looking at the movement of protons or hydrogen. When NAD is carrying electrons, it becomes NADH. In other words, it is reduced. So both FAD and NAD are electron carriers. And we can tell when they're carrying electrons because there's hydrogen at the end of the molecule. So here for FAD and NAD, you can see both the oxidized and the reduced forms. The oxidized form does not have any hydrogen. It's just FAD. But FADH2 indicates that it's carrying electrons. The same thing goes for NAD. NAD is oxidized. But the reduced form is NADH. That means it's carrying extra electrons. So how is energy transferred from one reaction to another? One of the greatest ways of this transfer of energy is through ATP. And I'm just letting you think about this. Remember that ATP is an activated nucleotide. Why is it activated? Activated means that it has that triphosphate tail, adenosine triphosphate. And that phosphate tail is where all of the energy is. And ATP is providing fuel for most cellular activities and for most cellular reactions. Now, where does the energy come from in the triphosphate tail? It comes there, it says that there are three negatively charged phosphate groups. But the truth is, in reality, that there's four negative charges in that triphosphate tail. And we're going to see it in the next slide. So you guys know that negative charges repel each other. So if a bond is holding two, ne two phosphate groups with negative charges, that bond must be mighty strong. And when that bond is broken, it's like poof. A lot of energy is released. So, so those, those bonds holding these negative phosphate groups, when they're broken, a lot of energy is released. So how much is a lot of energy? 
7.3 kilocalories. So I love this diagram 8.8a and here you see ATP and you see actually the triphosphate tail. You see three phosphate groups and you can see that there's four negative charges total. So all of those bonds that are holding each of those phosphate groups must have a lot of energy. They must have a lot of potential energy because potential energy is in the position. The position is in the bonds and when those bonds are broken then a lot of energy is released and that released energy is used to drive many chemical reactions at the cellular level. So here you see different forms of ATP. This one is as a space filling model. Here it's ATP viewed as a stick model. So how is it that ATP releases energy? Well, what breaks the bond? It's hydrolysis. But remember what I think? Like when I think, when I read hydrolysis, what I'm thinking in my head is hydrolysis. Hydro meaning water and lysis meaning break. So water goes in to break the bond. And when it does, it's going to release energy. And that energy is 7.3 kilocalories of energy per mole of ATP. In figure 8.8b, you can actually see the hydrolysis of ATP. So ATP in the presence of water is broken down to ADP plus inorganic phosphate plus energy. So what does ADP mean? It's adenosine diphosphate. And you guys know that when you hear the word di or you read it, di refers to two. Only two phosphates are left. Then you see this inorganic phosphate. Well, this inorganic phosphate oftentimes is carrying that energy with it to actually energize another reaction. You know, I always think of that, you know, children's game Duck Duck Goose. You know, when a child goes around the group and it says duck, 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 and then they poke on somebody and they say goose, that person has to stand up and chase them around the circle. Well, goosing at the cellular level is goosing with a phosphate. So energy can oftentimes travel with that phosphate group. So we call it phosphorylation. We can phosphorylate a molecule and what we're doing is we're transferring energy for reaction to occur. So we usually call this transfer of energy as substrate level phosphorylation and we're going to see that in a little bit when we talk about cellular respiration in the following chapter. So that inorganic phosphate can carry with it that energy and this is called substrate level phosphorylation. So again what does phosphorylation mean? That means it's adding a phosphate to a group. Well why is that important? It's because that phosphate is carrying energy. Now when, it's when we phosphorylate a protein what is usually going to happen is that it's going to change the protein shape. So exergonic phosphorylation reactions are coupled to in endergonic reactions. So when ATP is hydrolyzed and, an AT and a phosphate group is released, that energy is going to be used to drive an endergonic reaction. I don't know if I particularly like figure 8.9. It's sort of hard to understand but you can see that an exergonic reaction in red releases energy. Notice that it goes from high potential energy, 7.3, to lower potential energy, which seems to be way less than 5. On the other hand, an endergonic reaction starts at 0 and it needs additional energy and that energy will come from ATP, the hydrolysis of ATP. That brings us to the, the last part of this chapter because we need enzymes to catalyze reactions. So let's go over this.
When we talk about metabolism, we're talking about the sum total of all the reactions in our body. But the truth of the matter is, is that reactions need help. And they get their help actually from enzymes. And all enzymes are proteins. But the, same, the opposite is not true. Not all, not all enzymes are proteins. Or not all proteins are enzymes, excuse me. But all enzymes are proteins. And these guys speed up reactions. So when we say it's a catalyst, it means that it accelerates the reaction. So how does it do it? How does it increase the rate of the reaction? Well, it brings the reactants together and then it twists them and orients them in a precise way so that the reaction will occur when the, when the atoms collide. So it says enzymes help reactions clear two hurdles. Well, what are the two hurdles? Well, it puts, it puts the reactants together and it changes the orientation so that when they collide, we know that bonds will break and new ones will form. So what it does this is it also lowers the amount of energy needed for a reaction to occur. Okay, so how does that happen? So how is it that enzymes can do this? Well, we already know that enzymes bring substrates together, but that place where they bring them together is called the active site. So the reactants fit in the active site and they orient each other and that's where the reaction occurs. So I said reactants, but notice in the slide it uses the word substrate. So I'm interchanging them, but I mean that they mean the same thing. So reactants and substrates mean the same thing. And it says once, once the substrates fit in the active site, then something happens. So they're moved so that they're in precise orientation to each other. Then bonds are broken and new ones are formed. And when the new ones are formed, then we have the product and the job is done of, of the enzyme. Okay, so to, to orient uh, the substrates together, uh, the, the enzyme has to go through a change, like they're shape changers. And this is called induced fit. So as soon as there are reactants or substrates in the active site, it's almost as if it's a trigger to change the shape of the enzyme. You know what my best analogy is? It's like Alice in Wonderland. Remember when she puts the key in the doorknob? All of a sudden the door seems the doorknob seems to melt and change its shape on the door. That would be induced fit. That's what we mean by a conformational change. In this example here, notice how large enzymes are. You know, it's a macromolecule. And in this case, it's called glucokinase. Most enzymes have ACE at the end of the word, and that's how you can tell it's an enzyme. And remember, when you see OSE at the end of the word, we're thinking about a sugar. So in this case, glucokinase is the enzyme that actually holds glucose. So glucose will bind to the active site with the addition of ATP. And once it fits, into the active site, then the enzyme glucokinase is going to go through a conformational change. It's going to shape change. And when it does that, it's going to put stress on the bonds. And when it puts stress on the bonds, it is going to lower activation energy and speed up the reaction. Okay, so activation energy, what is it? All molecules or all, all um, reactions have this thermal barrier. And to overcome this thermal barrier, uh, we need a catalyst. So this thermal barrier is activation energy. It's the amount of energy required to reach a transitional state. In other words, this transitional state is a, is, is a state where there's stress 
on the bonds. There's stress on the bonds so that they can break and reform new ones. So it says that reactions occur when reactants have enough kinetic energy to reach the transition state. Remember the transition state is a higher energy state. So if an enzyme can lower that, then we would assume that the reaction would happen much more quickly. So let me think about this. If, if you could see me, you would see that I'm such an old lady and that it takes me such a hard time to get out of a chair. So before I get out of a chair, when I'm in private of course, is I start rocking back and forth to get that momentum to push myself out of the chair. So that's in fact what an enzyme does. It lowers, it lowers the amount of momentum that I need for me to get out of my chair or it lowers activation energy. I love this diagram here because notice it has delta G and it also has that new phrase activation energy. Doesn't activate activation energy look like a speed bump? It's that like big bump on the graph and that's what an enzyme does. It lowers the activation energy. So notice on one side of the activation energy, the left side, you see the reactants or the substrate and on the other side you see the products. In this case, the products have lower, lower energy than the reactants. So this is definitely an exergonic reaction. So low enzymes lower the activation energy. In other words, they lower that speed bump. They lower the speed bump. So they're not involved in the reaction, but they lower that thermal energy or that little molecular speed bump so that a reaction can occur. So what's my best analogy if I give it a speed bump analogy? It's like they remove all of the speed bumps around Cielo Vista Mall. That way, if I need to buy a gift at the last moment, I can speed with my car to the appropriate store, buy my gift, and then speed away so I can give it to a person. But if there's speed bumps, I have to slow my car down and go over the speed bumps. So that's what an enzyme does. It sort of removes the speed bumps. And in this case, instead of gar cars going faster, chemical reactions the rates of chemical reactions will go faster. I love this second figure, figure 8.12. So in this figure here, you see that an enzyme has lowered the activation energy. So in other words, we don't need so much energy to get to this transition state. And notice that the bonds are indi indicated by the dashed lines. That means that they're stressed they're in this conformational change so that bonds will break and new, new bonds will form. Old bonds will break and new bonds will form. Notice in this diagram there is no change in delta G. The only thing that has changed is the change in activation energy E sub A. So E sub A activa activation energy is lowered by enzymes. So there's three steps to lowering activation energy, initiation, the transition state, and termination. In this diagram you can see exactly what's happening. The green indicates the enzyme and the substrates are indicated by the orange and red colors of the molecules. So notice in frame one is initiation. It's sort of like a lock and key. There's one enzyme for every reaction and notice that all of the substrate exactly fits into the enzyme at the active site. Once they fit in, you can see in step two that there's been a conformational change. In other words, the shape of the enzyme has changed and when it does, it's reorienting the atoms 
and it's also stressing the bonds and that's why you see dashed lines between A and B and between B and C. So this stress or conformational change actually breaks the bonds and allowing for new ones to form. So notice in frame three you see termination products of, of, of an enzyme mediated reaction. You see that once it's done then the molecules are released. Okay, so what can limit the rate of a catalyst? So catalysis means that there's something like an enzyme speeding up a reaction. So it says the speed of an enzyme catalyst reaction increases linear at low substrate con concentrations, but as concentrations increase, then it reaches a maximum speed and slows down. So why is that? So in this graph right here, we see two lines, one in red and one in blue. So the one in blue is an uncatalyzed reaction. So what it says here, if you have more reactant, you're going to have more product, right? If you have more substrate or reactant, then you're going to have an increase in product. But if you look at the red line, notice at the very beginning it increases, but then it starts to level off. So instead of it being a two-way, it's a three-way. So there's something more than just substrate and product. There's actually the third component. And that third component is an enzyme. So if the substrate's increasing, but there's not enough enzyme, then the rate of reaction is gradually going to slow down. And you can see that that's exactly what's happening in this diagram with the red line bending bending and almost becoming level. There's not an enough enzyme even though there's, there's an increase in substrate. What is this called? What is this called when you start having a lot of reactant but you don't have enough enzyme? This is called saturation kinetics. So what do we mean by saturation kinetics? What would be a good analogy? To me, I think the grocery store is the best analogy, like around 5 o'clock. When it's 5 o'clock and I know that I have some of the ingredients for dinner but I don't have all of them, I rush to the store and I'm really aggressive. I'm rushing and I'm running down each of the aisles trying to get all of my ingredients for dinner. But then I go to the checkout line and even though I'm rushing and rushing and running around, there's only two people checking out the groceries. So what starts to happen is all of the people with carts start piling up. So this is called saturation kinetics. So what is the enzyme in my analogy? It's the people at the checkout counter. And I'm trying my best. There's a lot of substrate, but there won't be a lot of results unless there's more enzymes. In other words, I can't go any faster. The limiting factor or the number of checkout stations opened at the grocery store saturation kinetics. Okay, another question is, do enzymes work al alone? And the answer is definitely not. They're helped by cofactors, coenzymes, and prosthetic groups. Now, you intuitively know this. You don't need for me to tell you. And that's why we take our vitamin in the morning, because our vitamins have minerals and they have organic molecules. And these help with reactions. And that's exactly why we take them. So when we talk about a cofactor, we're talking about an inorganic, um, an inorganic ion such as zinc and magnesium and even iron. When we talk about a coenzyme, we're talking about um, an organic molecule. So this could be NADH or FADH2. And then we have prosthetic groups. So a prosthetic group is a non-amino group that also is helping out with reactions. And I bet you you can imagine this will be on your test. What factors affect enzyme function? So what factors do affect it? Well, when we did our lab on enzymes, when we looked at lactose and lactase, remember lactase broke down lactose 
to glucose and galactose. And we could actually measure the amount of glucose using test strips. But isn't it true when we talk about optimum conditions, if you look at a graph, an optimum condition is going to look like a mountain. It's, it can't be too hot, it can't be too cold, it has to be just right. It can't have too low a pH or too high a pH, it has to be just right. So temperature and pH or the amount of acidity affects, affects enzymes and therefore the rate of reactions. So in figure 8.15 you see blue and red lines in both graphs and notice that they go up and then they go down. So when we talk about an optimum temperature or an optimum pH you should say to yourself oh yeah the graph is always going to look like a mountain. It's always going to peak at the optimum level and if it's too little or too much then then the reaction rates will go down. So in this case here the blue line represents enzymes from a bacteria living in a cool and neutral environment and the red line represents an enzyme collected from a bacteria found in a very hot and acidic environment. So notice that the optimum temperature for these two different bacteria will be different and that makes sense. And also notice that the optimum pH between the two is also different. So optimum, the optimum uh, activity of an enzyme depends on what type of organism you collect it from. Now these enzymes are regulated. A long time ago, maybe several years back, they used to say that things are, you know, um, things are so cheap at, at big lots, it's because at the factory someone forgot to hit the off button, so they made more product than what could be sold. So that's why they're selling them at, at big lots for reduced price. But at the cellular level, how do we get enzymes to stop working? What is the trigger to get them to go? And what, is the, and what, is, what are the triggers to stop an enzyme from working? So first of all, when we have re regulatory molecules, attaching them to an enzyme may either activate or inactivate the function of an enzyme. So the two types of signaling to stop a reaction are called competitive inhibition and allosteric regulation. So what's the difference between the two? For competitive inhibition, there's actually a plug that forms at the, active, at the active site itself. It is competitive inhibition. In other words, that plug is competing for the active site. Then the second mode of regulation is allosteric regulation. And this is when a molecule binds to the enzyme at a site that is different from the active site. And when it binds, as you can see, is going to change the shape of the enzyme and either activate or deactivate the enzyme. So it's going to start this conformational change or shift in its appearance. I love this diagram in 8.16. At the very top in red is we see competitive inhibition. So notice here there's a lock and key type situation between the substrate and the enzyme. Notice that the substrate fits perfectly well into that enzyme. But notice here at the very top there are these blue molecules that are taking the space of red. In other words, it's forming this plug and it's, it's, preventing, it's preventing other red molecules from entering. This is called competitive inhibition. It's stopping the reaction by plugging the active sites. So how else can we stop an enzyme from working? We can do this through allosteric regulation. So not at the active site, but at a secondary site, you can actually put another molecular plug. And this is called um, allosteric regulation. Now 
allosteric regulation can be used to turn off things, but it can also be used to turn on other activities that are going on within your body. So regulating enzymes via covalent modification. Regulation may involve covalent modifications, and really most of the time it does. There are some irreversible changes, but most of the changes are reversible. And this will help with the coupling of endergonic and exergonic reactions. That transfer of energy is often done through the transfer of a phosphate group. So keep in mind that proteins or amino acids can change the shape of the molecule itself and it can either activate or inactivate an enzyme. In this example here, the unphosphorylated form is not activated. But if you bring two phosphates, notice that these phosphates are nice and bright. And notice here that the red, the red loop has actually shifted. It's shifted in such a way that is activating this this molecule to do work. Okay, the last thing that I want to talk about are metabol metabolic pathways. So in this diagram at the very bottom of the slide, do you see A, B, C, and D? So we start off with one substrate, we end up with another, and that substrate fits into another chemical reaction, and it spits out a new product, product C, and then it goes on further and further. So when we have a chain of reactions, we, we, we see that we have enzyme 1, enzyme 2, and enzyme 3. So you'll often see these uh, very, the enzymes very close to the side of the reaction. So that brings us to feedback inhibition. So how do we stop a series of reactions from happening? Well, we need feedback inhibition. So it says here, feedback inhibition occurs when an enzyme in the pathway is inhibited. So it's not working very well. So that way, a new, a new uh, molecule is sent to actually either stimulate or stop a pathway. So pathways produce products, but when those products are no longer needed, then, um, then the molecule is used and when it's not being used then it should be destroyed. So this is how it actually works. So if we look on the left hand side we see enzyme 1, 2, and 3 and each of these are producing liquids. Uh, they're producing products that are going to help with enzyme 1 and then later on the intermediate will be enzyme 2. So what is controlling this pathway? What's controlling this pathway is the final product, enzyme 3. So if, if enzyme 1 is reassociated with um, uh, the mineral that has started the reaction, then the product from the pathway will regulate or slow down um, the use of enzyme 1 in a metabolic pathway. Your book talks about the evolution of pathways, and I know that it's really important, but I don't want to confuse you with a lot more detail, so I'd like to skip it. But I'm just reminding you, what is bioremediation? It's engineering new pathways to clean up pollutants. So you can tell right in our own country, there's several that are working on their own, and um, Uh, they're not regulated. So I was going to use an, 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 an analogy, but I can't think of the rest of what I was going to say, so please excuse me. Okay, so here it shows you the evolution of how a pathway is born. It's nice to know, but this is not going to be on your exam. And the last thing that you need to know is that there's two types of metabolic pathways, catabolic and anabolic. Catabolic is breaking things down, and anabolic is building things up. So cellular respiration 
is a catabolic pathway. Photosynthesis, on the other hand, is an anabolic pathway. So I hope, I hope this helps you understand this chapter.